Hello and welcome to the new episode of Ings Podcast. Today with us we have a very special guest. We have with us Mr. Utpal Kumar, who is opinion editor of First Post and News 18. We all know him for his incisive pieces, which gets published in First Post and News 18. He writes on civilizational issues, politics, and diplomacy. Thank you, Utpal ji, for joining us for this conversation. I am sure it's going to be very engaging and very enlightening for our viewers. So to start with, uh, I found the title of this book very intriguing. Bharat Rising. So to start with, can you tell us uh, what is this book actually about? Thank you, Sisir. Uh, thanks for your nice introduction. Uh, coming to the book, Bharat Rising. Uh, it is. It is actually the, uh, my attempt to tell the story of uh, New India, Nya Bharat, uh, which is uh, which uh, a term which we, we are hearing for last almost ten years now. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the thing is you know uh, the contradiction in the narrative when we when, when we talk about uh, uh, when we look at the narrative of bharat from uh, within the country uh, that the, the feeling of you know that uh, uh, the country is uh, is making a uh, the change on the ground things are moving uh, the development infrastructural development is there uh, civilizational awakening is there but uh, the moment you know we shift our gaze outside the global media and also the left liberal narrative uh, suddenly we we are made to believe that uh, all you know thanki dori things are you know uh, uh, democracy is slipping um, uh, then you know uh, liberal liberalism is shrinking in this country uh, dictatorship or authoritarian streak is uh, gaining ground so that kind of feeling that kind of narrative is also being pushed by a certain quarters and that quarter is actually very strong that has been uh, th- their stronghold uh, have, uh, they they have always you no know, dominated the narrative worldwide so my book has been attempt to just in my own limited way to correct that narrative to uh, to make things uh, to make this narrative about bha- rising bha- bharat rising uh, in a, in a proper perspective to make it like you know Yeah, uh, how it is a positive uh, development and not a and not a negative one. Yeah, uh, Utpal ji, uh, when we talk about Bharat, uh, usually it is seen as a juxtaposition of Bharat versus India, uh, uh, the idea of India versus the idea of Bharat. How do you react to such kind of uh, contradiction that is being presumed when we talk about Bharat? Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll 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 I must confess that I have no problem with the term India. in fact that's uh, made in india or make in india is is something you know we we have made a global uh, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of global uh, um, uh, uh, thing for us you know we have taken it globally and p- uh, people uh, across the world know us through make in india thing india per se but you know uh, i uh, if you ask me personally i prefer bharat bharat because bharat connects me with with the roots the civilizational roots a root which you know we have unfortunately in last uh, uh several decades in fact since independence in independence uh, we have uh, consciously try to negate that we have tried to deny that and that's where the 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 contradiction of you know the idea of india and idea of bharat comes the people who try to push that idea th- those who are the proponent of idea of india they want to make us believe that india is a creation of a constitution india is a creation of uh, 1947 independence india is a creation of nehruvian uh, uh uh democracy per se uh which is not the fact which is not if you if you if you negate the civilizational part of this country if you negate the indic cultural uh, ethos uh then you know the story is not really uh it's a half the story and you, you just see what happened with the part which got away from the country pakistan and bangladesh they couldn't remain a secular country even for a decade democracy is floundering there minorities are unsafe which is not the case in this country so the the the, the only reason why it is happening is that this 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 landmass has always been liberal civilizationally the, the thing that's why i prefer the the idea idea of bharat because that will tell the entire story in its totality okay great uh Utpal ji, your book has come uh, at a very important juncture of our civilizational journey. 
रिसेंटली ऑन ट्वेंटी सेकेंड ऑफ जनवरी प्राण प्रतिष्ठा ऑफ राम लला राम जन्म राम टेम्पल टुक प्लेस इन द बुक ऑल्सो यू मेक अ वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग आर्ग्यूमेंट अबाउट लिब्रेशन ऑफ द टेम्पल्स the the places of worship act is also in much news people are uh, people are commenting upon it there is a discussion and uh, uh, you make a strong case for liberation of temples uh, what do you have to say about it and uh, how do you react to the obsession of political parties cutting across the ideologies uh, with, with controlling the temples how do you react to that See that uh, the three four aspects we talked about in this question. First, uh, let's talk about temples. What is what is a temple? Temple is not just for Hindu temple. I'm talking about. It's not just a place of worship. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Historically and culturally, if you see, you go uh, back in the history and see the role of temple. It, its role was uh, uh, much much wider, much much diverse. You know, from literary to 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 art and craft to uh, dances uh, to uh, to even like you know building roads and dams temples you to do that so the problem is that you know the moment you weaken the temple you are weakening the hindu society and that's that's why the reason you know why temples were one of the first institution to be attacked when the any any invasion you take place in this country for you know why would mohammed um uh, Uh, in 19, uh, 1025 AD, he attacked Somnath, uh, Mahmud al Ghazni. Why did he attack? He attacked because one, there was wealth, no doubt, but it was also a symbol of Hinduism, the very, uh, the very, gay, uh, very most splendid form of you know uh, uh, physical manifestation of Hinduism was it were temples. So they were attacked precisely for that reason. uh this is another matter that you know our historiography you know turn into something else you know uh, irfan abib and his father mohammad habib they came up with this school of you know history which which taught us that uh, it, it was just about uh, gold and uh, material wealth inside the temple which led to the attack on the temples truth is not that of course you know they took took the wealth away but only the wealth was not the reason and it, it 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 i'll give example of you know 1025 uh, ad attack of somnath you know when the <coughs> when the priests and uh, other hindus they offered mahmud ghazni ki please take the wealth but don't destroy the somnath temple mm-hmm. he refused he said no i i can't do that this is against my uh, uh, the ethos of my religion which i follow and he destroyed it so he took the wealth but he also destroyed it the problem is you know how till till uh, most part of our hist- uh, historiography just focus on one aspect of it and try to deny the second one mm-hmm. <coughs> now temples are imp- uh, so that's why the, that's why the temples have been attacked and targeted for years uh, coming to a second part about why you know uh, temples should be liberated and why other political parties are are not really uh, uh, that uh, liberal enough to leave it yeah. uh, uh, See, it's easy money. Let's be very honest about that. Uh, the kind of you know, uh, uh, I believe this is my personal view. The kind of you know, the uh, economic policies we pursue, it's 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 it's, it's, it's very uh, wasteful in nature. Where you know, provide television to voters, you provide four rupees, me, you get chawal mil jayega. Yeah. So ten rupees, me, you get a full bhojan khalenge. From where the money is coming? So these are the easy money, and government looks for the easy money. It's very easy money, this which our you know, temple uh, provides. I'm still okay with that if it co- it goes in the cause of nation building. Though I believe I fail to understand that why Hindus should sir only do that. Let other you know, uh, work and madrasas and, and uh, church have a lot of. This will also contribute to the nation building. If that is the idea behind that. Um, but my biggest problem with this you know this uh, state control of temples is, is is bigger and it is uh, how it has been misappropriated. and there is a report which you know uh, anand ranath in his book uh, wrote about that you know in in uh, in uh, uh, tamil nadu for instance just 1% of the the actual money which the land should give is acquired 99% is, is appropriated by vested elements 
the land have been grabbed, those land have been like they have taken on the rent, they just give one percent of it or the market price. Now this is this is sheer wastage of the of the first property. One is not helping the Hindu cause, it's also not helping the nation's cause. Many people will say that oh chalo, yaar, Hindu ko kar rahe, why are you thinking of sectarian point of view? This ko to kar rahe, this ko bhi nahi kar rahe. This is against and is actually against the, uh, <coughs> against the interest of the nation too. So, so, so that's the reason why you know I believe that this is this is one of the very important things you know which we should get rid of. But my biggest problem with this uh, uh, with with state state control of temples is, uh, is 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 psychological. Why only Hindu temples should be controlled by state when you know? And the state is not bothered about uh, other institution of other minority communities. Does it mean what you know Sai Deepak writes in his book, you know, India That Bother? Does it mean that you know the government believes that Hindus are incapable of running their institutions? Mm -hmm. I think these are the very uh, hard questions. Yeah, I think they, they, they should answer. If they believe that Hindus are uh, not capable enough, then it's fair enough. But they should come out and say. Otherwise, they should run. Either they should run for everyone, or they should not run for anybody. Uh, at one point in the book, Utpalji, you say that uniform civil code is very <coughs> important. In fact, it is more important than the uh, liberation of temples is more important uh, than uniform civil code. Uh, why do you say that? Uh, ah, it's interesting. It's, I've been asked this question uh, previously by a few of my readers. And they thought that I'm against uh, uniform civil code. No, I'm not actually. I believe that a secular nation, a secular state, in a, not in the secularism the way we, we, uh, our politician profess, but uh, Sarvadham somehow uh, that is a phenomena which this Indic uh, land pursues. From that perspective, I believe that you know UCC is a need of power. Why should <coughs> different people have different you know uh, uh, legal rights just based because uh, one is a Hindu and one is a Muslim? I mean, it, it, it relies, you know, it defies any logic. Uh, my, my only problem is something else, and that, that I, I found by when I went into the history. In the 50s, you know, when uh, uh, Hindu code will was being made, uh, there were several Hindu uh, 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 Hindu, uh, like Mitaksha was there, the Bhag was there, the Hindu law of inheritance was there. Several hundreds of <coughs> some of them were very progressive. Some of them actually gave more rights to women. Mm -hmm. Down south, they were there, you know, Nambudri. Uh, they give, uh, they were very progressive in the nature. So what that Hindu code will did, they got worse and the best. They chose the two and got in the middle of that. So it was like a middling of the, of the of, of, of the law, yeah. which is fine. Which I still believe that we needed a code, we good. Now today, for instance, today for instance, again if we push the UCC, uh, I fear it's my personal fear. I fear that uh, uh, government will think it as a you know as a compromise on the part of the minority communities. Despite the fact that majority communities have already done that uh, some 70 years back. Yeah, of course. But that part will be forgotten. So just to make, uh, and our politicians are very, you know, used to appeasement. Just to make them feel good about it, they will do still, they might put, and it's my apprehension, they might put some provision, some clause, which might not be uh, in the interest of the majority community. Just for the face of it, just for the perception of it, just to make them, okay, aapke saath humne kiya, dekho, inke saath bhi humne kiya hai. Now that's where, and I have a problem with the middling laws. Now already, we have got Hindu code bill. Now UCC may, if they try to even do the middling part there, middling laws, you know, somebody, aapki bhi rahi, inki bhi rahi, then where are we going to compromise? So I, I think, I think we need to just uh, actually see the what, the what the UCC provisions are, and then only uh, we should, uh, we should be able to, you know, comment on that. But on principle, I'm, I'm okay for that. It's every, any secular society, any liberal society needs one law for everyone. Okay. Uh, Utpalji, now I'll come to a very important question. Uh, we are witnessing a very uh, important social change 
where we are witnessing that the youth in the new India is not apologetic about their civilizational ethos. They are wearing their religion, their civilization on their sleeves. Uh, earlier, it is not it not used to be the case. Uh, people were reluctant to openly profess their religion. It was thought that if you are if you are religious, you are communal. So now that is changing. Uh, what we witnessed in the Pran Pratishtha in Ayodhya, people are unapologetically, unabashedly they are they are embracing their religion. They are they are uh, 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 arguing for their civilizational rights. Why do you think that and how, what is the force behind this change? What has happened? <coughs> uh, I, I should first say that this change is, you know, like many of uh, Western elements will try to project it negatively. It's not a negative force. Mm -hmm. This, you're, you're waking up to your history, you're waking up to your past, you are, you're, 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 you're touching your roots. Mm -hmm. That's in, in no way is going to threaten your future, your, your you know, modern outlook. But this is happening. In fact, uh, I, I remember my brother. You know, he he went to um, uh, uh, my brothers. He went to um, Banaras after the renovation and everything, and he was startled. He was startled to see the crowd there. They were mostly <coughs> young crowd, like you and me, thirties, forties, mid forties, coming with their kids. Banaras Ghat mein ghum rahe. And they're, they're enjoying, they're talking about that. They're owning up that city. And he told me something which I really found very fascinating. He said, you know, I went there in, in, uh, in mid-2000s and the outlook was actually different. Only the old will go. There were certain you know, kind of people you'll see there. So this shows, you know, this shows that this, this, uh, this land, you know, this this civilization, people are waking up to that. They want to explore their past. The young are going there, and they are not going there out of religious city per se. I mean, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't believe that you know Hindus wear religion their sleeves, but they are now they are now not apologetic about calling themselves Hindus, mm -hmm. and 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 they are not uh, uh, like you know, they are absolutely confident enough to defend their uh, what they believe in. So that that change is happening, and that change. Is 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 uh, I think it's still a work in progress, and that's what you know. Certain you know, left liberal, liberal quote unquote elements are fear about. You know, because they fear that you know this will take it to Hindu supremacism. This will not. You wake up to your past. This will make you only more confident about you, who you are. And and trust me, every civilization or every individual, for instance, you and I, we all look for who I am. Mm -hmm. That is the one question we often ask ourselves. Every civilization, that question is being asked, mm -hmm. and India is asking that question. And and thankfully, this younger, this is young nation, old civilization, older civilization, but young population, young, they are looking for their, they are in, they are searching for their old civilization roots. So that's very heartening. Okay, uh, Utpal ji, uh, uh, how far do you think that uh, emergence of Narendra Modi as as the tallest leader in the country contributed to this this change? Uh, because a lot of people link <laughs> emergence of Narendra Modi and coming BJP coming into power to this change. Uh, has it a kind of multiplier effect? It has, did you feel that? Do you feel that this actually affected the social change? I think it happened both ways. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I will, it will be wrong to deny what, you know, Narendra Modi has done. He has, you know, uh, he has in no way pushed, promoted the idea of Bharat. No doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But also we need to know that I think, I believe that the, the, the people of this country were also getting ready with that. Mm -hmm. I and mean, the kind of, you know, the, the, the way they voted for him in 2014, just look, it took 30 years. For a, for a national leader, for a party to get that kind of majority in this country, why? Why? People didn't want to vote. They wanted to, but they didn't find that resonance, what they wanted to hear their leaders say. So people were also ready. It's a very, very mutual, you know, yeah. this thing. People were also ready. They wanted to hear the leader say something, mm -hmm. not the same old narrative. You know. He talked about that. The moment he talked, started talking about 2013, 14. People voted to him like anything. The same thing happened in 2019, despite all the narrative uh, setting being done. 
You look what happened. The party only gained more vote. <coughs> so at one aspect, at one, at one aspect, I believe that Modi has helped push this uh, this phenomena further. At the other uh, reason, people were also ready and they pushed Modi ahead. So I think they worked together in that way. In tandem. Yeah, were. yeah, in tandem. Uh, so, Utpal ji, now I, I'll, I'll just ask a very important question which is politically uh, very relevant. Uh, the new India, which we are, uh, whose emergence we are witnessing, is often criticized by left liberal whom you called an oxymoron because there's no, I, as you said in one of your interviews, that if you are left, you're not liberal. And if you are liberal, you can't be can't left. Be left. So, uh, they, uh, it is being criticized with this section of left, left liberal class uh, claiming that India is, uh, the new India is uh, 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 the democratic institution, the democracy in this new India is under assault. It is under assault, is being targeted, damaged. Uh, and to target Narendra Modi, because obviously he is, uh, he is the leader, supreme leader right now, uh, Nehru is often invoked. It's a kind of juxtaposition where the Nehru is posed, juxtaposed against Narendra Modi. Uh, you have written in detail about Nehru's legacy in the book. What is your take? What is your views and assessment about Jawaharlal Nehru? Uh, this is a very important question. I believe that if you want to judge Narendra Modi and or Modi government, you should do on facts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it just can't be that I मुझे लगता है ऐसा इसीलिए ऐसा है ऐसा नहीं हो सकता ना you have to go by facts and that's why what I did is I I talked about Modi government I talked about the new India then I went into fifties sixties and uh, and then looked into the on the same parameters looked into how Nehru operated for instance and I was astonished that uh, any the result were quite, you know, uh, opposed to what people want us to believe. I'll give an example for that. <coughs> and people believe that I'm anti, uh, people may assume that I'm anti uh, uh, Nehru. But I'm not, I, I'll tell you, I'll go into that part. First, let's, let's go into how I, I um, premise of my argument. Uh, let's take for example book banning. Mm -hmm. Do you tell me how many, how many books have been banned in the last 10 years? Do you remember any? No, hardly. You won't even recall. But it's the fascist yeah. government. In the 50s and early 60s, in more than two dozen books were banned by Nehru government. More than two dozen, and that's a very conservative number. Number, yeah. Uh, some of the films were banned just because it didn't appeal to the to to, to the people uh, and the corridors of power. Now that's not a sign of a very uh, democratic setup per se, because no one questioned that. Now tell me again. I'll ask you another question. How many people uh, uh, have been jailed in last 10 years for calling uh, Modi Hitler? Of course, hardly. I mean. uh, now, I'll give you an example of hardly anybody. I can definitely tell you that it might not be people of consequence. Yeah. Now, I'll give you a similar example in the 50s. Uh, Majur Sultan Puri, one of the notice laces, he was jailed for two years just because he likened Nehru with Hitler. Two years, and no one talked about that. Uh, we all talk about press freedom, and I find it the most baffling, uh, this argument about that. I work in media day in and day out, I know, and I know how it works. Uh, say the press freedom is over, the is over. I went to the 50s and found out, uh, I went detail into the First Amendment, which, uh, which uh, Nehruji brought. Mm -hmm. First Amendment actually muzzled uh, press, press freedom. freedom. Yeah. <coughs> If you go into the discussion of that press, uh, this first, uh, first Amendment bill in Parliament, you will find that some of the people who, who actually oppose First Amendment are the very people who are today demonized as Hindutva leaders, mm -hmm. including, you know, uh, our, um, uh, I the name, uh, uh, the leader from Bengal, our... Uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Shama Prasad Mukherjee. He read, read, read his, you know, uh, uh, this uh, intervention in Parliament in favor of uh, press. Mm -hmm. My point is the history we are taught is the history which historians wanted us to believe and not the history which actually happened. That is the problem, and that, that's where my problem was there. If you find this government totalitarian, if you believe that you know secularism is sliding, then come up with facts 
and yes, make it. And there is always room for improvement, no doubt about that. And there will always be room for improvement. But just to say that you know we had a golden era in the past, and now we are all going to vanish. Is, is a bumcom. I will is absolute bumcom. That's where I have a problem with them. I, but in the same line, I'll say that you know I am not someone who believes that Nehru is a was a was a fascist or Nehru was a anti-national or Nehru didn't love India. I genuinely believe. I have read his biography. I have I have followed him. He may have you know flaws in his personalities, his uh, ideologies, and everything. But he definitely loved this country. Mm -hmm. His. His, his his interpretation of uh, the things is wrong. Maybe in the 30s and 40s, you know, the, being a leftist or being communist was fashionable. It was fashionable. It was fashionable till 90s, I know. So, so it was very different. And many of the people who later turned into the right wing were, began their career as a, as a communist, a hardcore communist. So maybe because of that, but but definitely we should today when we look back, we should have the courtesy of you know or or, 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 or at least. The courage to say what is right and what is wrong. So that's what I try to do this book. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Utpal ji, in the book you write that the criticism from the left liberal of the current political dispensation, the Modi government, comes from the fact that Modi government democratized and it decolonized the Lutian world. Uh, and the, the, the reason given by left liberal is the, that... Uh, there's an assault on democracy and uh, democratic institutions are under threat. It's all an excuse. Basically, this is a reaction to the fact that Lutian world is democratized. Uh, what What is the idea behind this argument? What uh, is the thought? I'll say that, you know, it's not democratic. It's, a, it's still a process. It's a working process. And I, I believe, <coughs> I honestly believe that, you know, that uh, today the people who are going in, Tomorrow, even tomorrow, they will start behaving like the Lutian yeah. Delhi 2.0. That apart, I'm happy that at least the door has been broken. The door has been breached, and new people are allowed to at least go in and have a feel of it. They also deserve to have, and not just one people with the certain thappers and uh, and uh, blah blah blah. Uh, so uh, at least I'm happy on that part. Uh, coming to the thing, you know, I remember, you know, uh, talking to Amish long back. In fact, I think in 2017 or 16. And I asked the same question you asked me. Why, you know, there's so much of uh, people are coming out against Modi government asking that, you know, this end is, is undemocratic and authoritarian. He, he, he gave us something similar. He said, you know, because it's mostly raised by people who were earlier the beneficiaries of the old system. So they were the, they were the old Lutin Delhi elites. So today they, they, are, they, are, they are out of power. They are out of the access. The main thing is access. Most of these people, including some of the topmost journalists, the access have been blocked. <coughs> so, so that 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 makes them angry. See, you are born with the belief that you you are somebody. You own this country or you run this country. And if you are access denied, then you are going to react. And that's how I see it that way. But I believe that it's it's, it's a thing in progress. The thing process, but they have, uh, and 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 still uh, the stronghold is there, I and mean, the, the, the it will take some really credible uh, effort on the part of the government and the civil society to actually breach it open. Okay, uh, that brings me to another question. Uh, there's a very important dialogue in Kashmir files which says that Sarkar kisi ki bhi ho system hamara hota hai. So as you say, how far do you think that apart along with the Sarkar? The system has also been breached and the system is also changing, of which in, ensured the entitlement for this Lutin world. System no doubt is changing, is it? I mean, government has changed in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, I still believe that uh, system uh, largely has changed, mm -hmm. but they still hope, they still hope uh, to see that something happened maybe uh, this year, elections turned some other way around. So still that's why the resistance is there. Uh, but uh, I, I believe that, uh, 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 as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It will take time. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a war on a multiple fronts. Mm -hmm. It's ideological, it's academic, it's political, of course. Uh, it's also uh, uh, bureaucratic. Bureaucratic, yeah. Of so, course. so that takes time, that will take time. Utpal ji, you come from Bihar and you have a deep understanding of Bihar politics. And as you must have witnessed something very interesting happened 
day before yesterday nitish kumar has again taken a u turn and he is again back to nda in the book you write a very interesting anecdote about nitish kumar that how lutin delhi tried to co-opt him and that is what uh, was kind of uh, undoing for him so can you tell us about that story because it's very interesting yeah that's that's quite a fascinating story in fact it tells how you know lutian's world works uh it so happened that you know that in uh, before 2014 elections 2012 13 uh people realized that the, the upa2 is going nowhere it's not going to come to power <coughs> so who after him so already there used to buzz about you know that you know nitish is somebody who can look into it. nitish was already doing well nitish record between 2005 and 10 in bihar was good incredible i myself wrote i went to kotna i saw the change there were a lot of expectations in there it was about that no i think things are going to change a lot of going to happen so uh, and i'm witness to that i have my piece is there uh, written an article on that to been um so by the 2010 there are elements who realize that this guy is there uh who can potentially lead uh, the nation mm-hmm. around the same time you know the modi storm was also rising in the west gujarat mein was a big power already and nationally also and the more people try to you know put him down the more he to come out stronger and actually it, it worked in his favor i i, I, I some believe <coughs> by 2012 when it was quite evident that uh, modi will take over the bjp uh adwani is not going to uh, uh, be the factor there uh lutians elite section of the government section started propping up nitish i remember one of the article by ramchand guha saying that nitish should now lead the national government mm-hmm. you know he should be the one and uh, the 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 incident which i mentioned in the book was about you know amad sen and nk sen nk sen was, uh, was with uh, <coughs> sorry <coughs> was with uh, jdu at that time the same nk sen was in the bureaucracy of uh, atal bihari vasbhai so you can see how you know lutians work as you said no government kisi ko uh, system, system in ka hota yeah. so he was with the uh, vasbhai government at the top most bureaucrat then congress came and he was there also so so he there was this gentleman so uh, in 2013 uh, i think just 3 days before if i'm not wrong 3 days before you know anitis uh, broke their lives with uh, with bjp uh, there was a uh, uh, party in uh, uh, in uh, uh, oxford yeah yeah uh, there was a party in oxford and uh, <coughs> amartya sen was there So and and guessing asked him, he said, "What is the option for uh, Nitish Kumar?" So uh, Amit Sen, in his own you know eloquent way, said, "Yeah, he has many options, but just one honourable one, or uh, one honourable option he has, and that honourable option was to leave the BJP, and that's where the the fire prime minister ambition, the fire prime minister was put into his head." he was a ambitious person no doubt but he was very good politician i'm very surprised that you know uh, and i am I'm very you know in awe of the the caliber of the lutian elite who managed to you know overpower the political acumen of nitish kumar and make him believe that he can be the national leader and, and he still believes so yeah of course he still believes so so that is the power and 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 how they work they work in a very concerted way okay. so yeah great uh utpal ji apart from writing on civilizational issues and politics you do write brilliant pieces on uh, diplomacy also so next few questions would be on diplomacy uh in the book you call modi jay shankar jugal bandi as brave new diplomacy in an uncertain world how do you see the new india's diplomacy in the past 10 years ah uh, uh, that's a very uh, difficult question to answer uh, but uh, <coughs> sorry uh see the way i see it the way you know for the last uh, uh 3 4 years have been very difficult for the world and for india especially covid mm-hmm. china china is still sitting on our border loc pbb and uh, ukraine mm. 
And now, now this is Gaza conflict. These four things, just let's take this four. This is all happened in the last four years. All these four years, uh, four incidents, if not tackled well, could have easily uh, led to India, you know, f of, uh, faulting somewhere. For instance, uh, uh, Ukraine, for instance. Ukraine, may, I think we, we, did, we followed a brilliant policy where, you know, we, we stuck to our gun, said that, you know, we will, we will, we believe that Ukraine is faulted, attacked, yeah. and there we are with Ukraine. But we will not just go out and be a party to the Western, you know, uh, this thing, uh, war machinery. We, we were categorical about that. So <coughs> that fine line which we followed, I think was, was a master stroke. And today, see, I think we, we, we gained out of it. We have come out as a more smarter nation, uh, uh, nation who, who, who puts uh, its self-interest, national interest, Above everything else, and that's what matters. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, my problem with Nehruvian uh, foreign policy was that it put uh, uh, ideological uh, compulsion above national interest. Yeah. Otherwise, why will you know like that? That chapter is also there in the book. Why will you know when <coughs> we are offered a security council seat and we will not accept it? Any any idiot will accept that thing. We'll say, well, it's a national honor. It was not for it was not for uh, Nehru. It was not an award for Nehru, it, it was something for the nation. He had no right to deny this country that right. But it happened because, you know, we saw from the prism of ideology. Today we are seeing from the prism of absolute national, national interest. And that's where I believe that the hope is there. We are now confident nation, the way we deal with West, the way we deal with China. Look at the way we deal with China. I think we showed the world how, how we can deal with the dragon. Mm -hmm. We are there. I mean, if they have one soldier, we have soldier matching them. One, so we have shown the world how we can deal with them. So and and I think I I believe that uh, China is caught in you know in its own you know uh, grand design there. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very fascinating phase for us, and I believe uh, next uh, ten year will be very crucial. Mm -hmm. If we pass this ten years of time. Then we always we, we already be the third largest economy in the world, with substantial you know uh, 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 backup of our own. And by that time, it will be very difficult to then ch change things for the worse. So that's why you'll see a lot of elements coming together. Suddenly, you'll see Khalistani movement coming in the in the West, and targeting in India. Canada says something because at some point when they are uneasy about India's rise. And that's why I believe that, you know, this is an uncertain world where you don't know who is your friend, but you have to follow that path. And I think they're doing quite brilliantly till now. Great. Uh, Utpal ji, uh, you write in the book and you argue about the fact of not holding dialogues with the Pakistan just for the heck of it, just for the sake of dialogue. How do you see PM Narendra Modi's foreign policy in relation to Pakistan? I think he's a, he's a smart PM. He started just like Vajpayee did. Yeah. Went to, invited Prime Minister from yeah. there, went there, I also met uh, <coughs> Nawaz Sharif. But when he realized that the outcome of that is, you know, a, a terror attack in Pulbama or at other places, he, 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 he's, he's also ready to accept the mistake and, and take a step back, unlike our, our other Prime Ministers. Our, our other Prime will just go on and on. I mean, they went to Lahore, but bas yatra, then Kargil happened, it's okay, invite them to Agra, Agra happened, and then you know, Manmohan Singh took it to a different level altogether where we would have by, lost Kashmir. Yeah. Thanks to, you know, uh, I was talking to one of the ambassadors, uh, uh, Pak, uh, uh, and he, who, who has understood that Pakistan is impeccable, and he said, Ki, we should be thankful to General Parvej Musharraf for not accepting that, the peace uh, uh, Kashmir plan. Because, you know, by the time we would, have, we would handle them, Kashmir on a platter to them. So we are lucky enough, we survived. So uh, that's where my, my thing is. You know, the reason why I believe that we can't talk to Pakistan, I have three uh, absolutely fundamental reasons for that. One is, you know, if you want to talk peace, you can only, uh, that can succeed only if they change of heart. I don't see that. In fact, they still want to destroy this country. I, mean, I, I remember one of my favorite uh, 
uh, anecdotes, you know, of Raji Dogra's book, you know, where, where, where borders bleed, is that, you know, that one of the ministers there, his desire, when someone asked was that, what is your, de what is your earnest desire? He said, you know, putting the both hands like this, I said, I want to drop, uh, I want to have a tumbo in my both arms, uh, hands, and I want to drop one in uh, Delhi and one in Mumbai. Uh, so this is, with this desire, you can't have talk. Talks, yeah. The second thing is, you know, whenever we talk to them, other, whenever we had talk, it will always come up with uh, bigger uh, terror attacks. And I, I and it's a, statistically, I'm, I'm backing this up. In the 2000s, especially when Manohar Singh government came, we were most uh, uh, passionately engaged with them mm -hmm. in talks, most passionately. And you remember at that time, we used to, I, used to, I used to work in Hindustan Times at that time. And we used to wonder, Achha, this Friday, maybe the next Friday there will be some bomb blast happen. And this was that predictable. And all cities were targeted. From Banaras to Delhi to Mumbai to Ahmedabad, every city were targeted one after another. Why should we talk? If, 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 if we know that if we talk, they will target us. Let's not talk, yeah. I mean, why? There's no purpose. Exactly. Being there's no, no reason we should talk to them. So, yeah, that's how it is. Great. Uh, so the next question, which I was also very uh, uh, kind of uh, made me think a lot. Uh, you write in the book that uh, India and West can be friends at best, but they can never be allies. Why do you say that? Uh, because, you know, their common, common, common interests are not same. Okay. That's the problem, you know, like see what is happening. India and U.S. have been, you know, uh, 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 are working very closely with each other. But are they really close? Mm -hmm. And when PM was visiting that country uh, this year, you look at the press, they were hostile. New York Times, Washington Post, all were prominent uh, newspapers, came up with articles one after another, saying that he, by inviting Modi, we, we are weakening the democratic forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, our ties with American, American ties with India is, is not good for democracy. This kind of thing, why it's happening? Uh, we have to realize that today, America is by heart still not really, you know, accepted the reality of, you know, true India-US friendship. We, are, we have actually friends with benefits. I think we, we should put it that way. Uh, for instance, you know, in America can't think of India, and uh, uh, if you want to deal with you know China for instance, that, that that problem is there, and and that problem is there right in front of their eyes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, so that's where you know they, they want to engage India, but at the same time they are wary of India, and that's a, that's the problem with the West per se. And they, they their wariness of this country remains, but they believe that once India uh, crosses a threshold, like once it becomes like you know. Uh, a ten trillion dollar economy, or after more than that, then it it, it automatically got too big uh, to be to maneuvered in in the way the West wants it to maneuver, and that's why you see things like you know Khalistani things happening. So America will come up and say that oh democracy is sliding. Some some report from UC SI, CIRF report will say that you know minorities are being targeted in this country. All this happening in the West, yeah, and they are our friends. So the by point is. <coughs> They will remain friends because of some common commonalities. And that commonality, maybe China is there. Because China is a big threat to the world. And they realize that they can't take on China without India. India has to be the axis of help come around which they can do that. So they are doing it. But they are also wary of India's rise. And I, and I, and I, I can understand, I, I can empathize with them. But they also, and why should they play second field to India? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Coming to the dragon, I mean, uh, how do you see India-China relationship panning out in the coming years? Do you think that we can be friendly neighbors? Uh, not right now, for sure. I mean, uh, and I don't see it happening anytime sooner. It, it can't be Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai, so it's a far-fetched thing now. We can't even be like um, uh, decent friends. Uh, and uh, this will continue. I think... Uh, uh, China is, uh, right now, I believe, I, mean, I, I, I was talking to a few of China's experts and they seem to also hold similar view. <coughs> China is testing ground, how far it can push India. Mm -hmm. uh, the good part is India has, you know, uh, and, and they're very good with 
Chinese have read mind really well and they plan well in advance. So right now what they're doing is they're building the infrastructure, but they're also seeing that, you know, what India is doing. And by India also not overtly seeking peace with them or looking out for dialogue. It's also giving a signal that India doesn't care. You mm are -hmm. making a road, road. Yeah. you are making a road. We'll also put our two soldiers here. So <coughs> the messaging till now is, is I think, uh, whatever opposition may say, whatever few uh, uh, China experts may say, I believe that the, the, the signal which India has sent to China and to the world at large is, I think, fantastic. China has realized that, you know, uh, uh, this India, India in the frontier, I mean, it's, 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 the challenge is real. Okay. And uh, uh, I think he'll have to change his policy. Still trying his luck, maybe a few more years, a decade or so. And then it might change. But they go for long term, so they will not change overnight. For the West also, the good part of the West has also seen what India can do. India can also stand. When the entire world does, you know, uh, flip-flops, India, last three years, on LSE has stood its ground, not given an inch, uh, blow by blow, I and mean, given it back to Chinese. So I think it's a very good uh, uh, this thing. But I don't see it's a friendship right happening you anytime soon. That, anytime yeah. soon. Okay, great. And we shouldn't be under illusion also. We shouldn't be expecting it also. Of course, of course. Uh, Utpal ji, coming back to Bharat, uh, and this would be a parting question. Uh, what do you think India should do? Three things. Three things India should do to ensure that Bharat keeps on rising? Oh. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a, a important question. Uh, one, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, it has to be a strong nation. So I'll put that first part, our military as well as uh, diplomacy, just strategic things together and say that there, we, we, we can't go wrong there. We have to be absolutely spot on. That Jugal Bandi, which you right now we're seeing between Modi and Jay Sankar, they said to go at least 10 to 15 more years, at least, with that same you know, intensity, with same thought process. One, this this covers the outside part, uh, the international part of it. Uh, internally, I believe that you know uh, that two 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 laws have done immense harm to this country. RTE. Mm -hmm. And you say, why RT? I remember, I come from a family. My, my family has a school. So I know, I know uh, last 10 years how, how difficult it has been to run schools in this country in the name of RT. I mean, uh, and RT is uh, only the, the non-minority institutions institutions are hit by that. Mm -hmm. Again, the same, what yeah. happened with temples happening here also. So, like for I'll give you one example which my brother was, you know, telling me the other, the other day. He told me that, you know, that uh, we are bound to take 25% uh, yeah, students here. But money, sometimes we get after two years. Now, I can still afford, he said, I can still afford, but well, I have some backing. Imagine some people who want to run a school for the, for, for, for the, for the society. Mm -hmm. Or there are many people who run for the community also. Uh, how, how are they going to do it? They can't. So last 10 years, tens of thousands of schools have been closed. So one thing is that I think we need to really look into that. And 10 years of uh, uh, this government, nothing had done. This is, this is, this is a UPA government um, uh, a relic, it's still surviving and, and it's still being continued. I think we need to really look into that because that's education. Education is the most important thing. We need to have a good education policy. And they have brought a uh, uh, new education, education, education policy. That's yeah. good of them. But I think we need to uh, uh, look into that. We need to also uh, club education with the skills which this government is trying to do, thankfully. The other thing is, uh, I'll still, you know, being the somebody who is very close to civilizing, I believe that please liberate Hindu temples. I and mean, by doing that, it's not just you are liberating the religious this thing. 80% of people are Hindus in this country. And, and uh, temples are, are kind of, you know, uh, make themselves sufficient. They will help the society yeah. do that. That, that, that. that was the framework, that's how it used to work earlier also. Even, even in the time of, you know, uh, till uh, uh, 
um, British came. This is how it worked and it worked beautifully. You see so, so the literature being produced from them. And <coughs> I went in the field of science. They used to do a lot of work. So I think just liberate them. It's, it's, it's also uh, not very um, uh, secular. It's very unsecular mm -hmm. part to just Close. to put that. So yeah, these are the three things I see it for my side. Thank you, Atpalji. It was a very engaging conversation and I'm sure that there would be good amount of takeaways from this conversation for our viewers. And uh, this book, Bharat Rising, Dharma, Democracy and Diplomacy, is, uh, is and it should uh, reach to a wider audience because it's an eminently readable book and it, it has got a lot, got lot of takeaways. So with that, wishing you all the best for the book. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, Sirji. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you.